Happy Sabbath, friends. I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is sure to come. I trust that you are keeping well and safe under the current pandemic, and I pray that uh, you will be blessed this morning as we fellowship together in the Word of God. This morning's Bible text is taken from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verses 1 through to verse 7. And just before we read those uh, verses together, I'm going to invite you wherever you are just to bow your heads as we pray for God's blessing. Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for the gift of life and for the privilege of studying your word together. I pray, dear God, that you will be with those who will be listening to this message, that your word will not return unto you void, but it will wrought and cause a transformation, a revival, and a reformation in each of our lives. I pray now, that, dear God, that you will bless the words of my mouth, that all that is said and done will bring praise, glory, and honor to your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. A story is told of a missionary who arrived at a mission station and was given a car that he could use. The only problem was that it would not start without a kickstart, and so it always needed a push. The first day, the missionary managed to get the school children of the mission station to give the car a push. After that, he would always park on a slight hill. Two years later, he became very sick and he was forced to leave. And so another new missionary came to the mission station, was shown the car and told how to get it started. The new missionary opened the bonnet and he found a loose cable. He tightened it with a spanner, started the car and the engine roared to life. For two years, the car could not start because of a loose cable, while the power was there all the time. Only a loose connection kept the car from running well. The only way, friends, we can survive during these uncertain times as a church is by staying close to Jesus, by praying for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on every member, on every family, so that revival and reformation can become a reality. The Holy Spirit is available to each one of us. God has promised to send His Holy Spirit. But many of us, like a car with the loose cable, choose to live our lives being disconnected from the source of spiritual power. And when we do, our lives become powerless, ineffective and odorless to the world around us. Within the context of 2 Kings chapter 6, we find here that Elisha was the prophetic successor of another great Old Testament prophet named Elijah. God had raised Elijah to be his spokesman during the very difficult and wicked times of the kings of Israel. Elijah had served his people faithfully, but the time finally came when God called his prophet to himself. And the Bible says that because of his devotion because of his faithfulness to God. God took him up to heaven in a chariot of fire. But before Elijah departed from this earth, God had called and commissioned his successor, Elisha. Elisha stood and watched as his godly mentor was taken up to heaven before his very own eyes. Now, before Elijah was taken away, a community of students had gathered around him. They are often referred to collectively in the Bible as the sons of the prophets. It appears that they constituted something like a seminary for prophets, where young people were taught how to walk a holy walk before God and was trained to speak for God's messages to his people during dark and fearful times. And after Elijah was taken up to heaven, his successor Elisha, to whom God had given a double portion of the prophetic spirit of Elijah, was looked upon as a, has the new head or dean of this school of the prophets. In time, the Bible says that the number of the sons of the prophets or students who had gathered around their mentor and teacher Elisha had apparently grown so large that they needed more room. The company of prophets had been blessed with numerical growth. Growth is good, but with growth, there will always be challenges. And the challenge for them is that they needed a larger meeting place and dormitory. They had outgrown the current place where they met together to study the word of God. And now they were in need of more space, of more rooms. And so 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 1 to 7. And so here is where we continue with the story. And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. 
Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And so he answered and said, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them, the Bible says. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And so the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And so he cut, and so he cut off a stick and threw it in there. And he made the iron float. Therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. And so the man reached out his hand and took it. Not only did they seek Elisha's permission to go, but they refused to go without him. When one of these prophets said to Elisha, Be content, I pray thee, to go with thy servants. He was not simply being polite. He was expressing the deep sense of the entire group that they needed Elisha to go with them. For he represented both the word and the voice of God. They needed him to accompany them because they needed to hear from God. These students resolved not to venture into this grand project of expanding their current premises without the presence of Elisha. And when requested to, Elisha agreed to go with them. By responding, by uttering these three powerful words, I will go. He was making a commitment not only to assist, but to work in the front lines by getting involved in the project. Notice the phrase, I will go, is not passive but active. It speaks of urgency. It speaks that no time need be lost. Let's get on with the task at end. Let's not be sidetracked by the little things that come our way, the roadblocks that Satan brings our way. But let us focus on the mission. Let us put our hand to the plow and expand and grow the kingdom of God. When I hear this prophet say to Elisha, Be content, I pray thee, to go with thy servants. I am reminded that faithful men of God hold up and strengthen each other's hands. And they are not afraid to get their hands dirty when dirty hands are needed. The Apostle Paul, the Bible says, picked up sticks to build a fire when his traveling companions, including his captors, were wet and freezing. That man who wrote most of the New Testament was not too proud to gather firewood. And here is Elisha going out into the woods to fell some trees and build a school for preachers. This man through whom God worked some stunning miracles did not consider himself too important to engage in the mundane activity of chopping down trees with an axe. Godliness and spirituality is not just reading your Bible. It's not just praying and singing hymns and going to church. Godliness and spirituality often involve sweat and labor and dirt. Godliness and spirituality are far more often connected with the common, ordinary things of life than most imagine. I remember or recall the stories conveyed to me of how the early pioneers of our churches here in Durban and beyond labored physically in building the structures, the churches, which we enjoy today. Wherever we can, friends, we must lend a helping hand to upkeep God's property and not wait for others to do it. Verses 4 and 5 of 2 Kings chapter 6 says, And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. While engaged in the noble work of extending the current theology building, this young man experienced a very great uh, trial. He had borrowed an axe from another man. And while he was working away, the axe head flew off the handle and was hopelessly lost in the murky, muddy waters of the Jordan River. And so when reading this story, I asked myself the question, what was the big deal? Why was the young man so grieved? Now that's because I never before stopped to consider the plight that the man was now in. The word alas seems to denote that he regarded his loss as final and had no expectation it would be retrieved by a miracle. It was a painful loss to the young student. 
The young man was obviously a very poor man or he would have not have needed to borrow an axe in the first place. By the loss of this axe head, he had now incurred a debt he could not pay. But most importantly, I think his expression seems to indicate that he was now filled with grief because though there was much to be done for God, he was now useless and ineffective in the work to which he was devoted. In Bible times, the axe was composed of two pieces, the handle and the axe head. These two pieces were positioned together and tied down with leather. The leather was then soaked in water. The soaking in water would cause the leather to shrink and tighten up. The more it was used, the looser the leather became. It was common for the axe heads to come loose and go flying off when the axe was being used. Flying axe heads uh, presented such a danger that God gave Moses a special law to take care of a situation where an axe head may come off and kill another man. It would be an accident, but God had the people specify certain cities for a man to go to in case he accidentally killed another man. These cities were called the cities of refuge. And so if a relative or a family member of the dead man wanted to take revenge on the man who caused the accident, the man, the guilty man, could flee to any one of these cities and be guaranteed safety. When Elisha's student lost his exit, he had lost his cutting edge and work could not continue. Do you realize this morning that we need axes for many of God's assignments? Now, I'm not talking about an actual axe, but about the axe mentioned in the book of Acts. God has given everyone a special instrument that makes us effective for the work of his kingdom. It is the axe of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to accomplish God's work. These axes are called gifts of the Spirit. God is calling us today, friends, to become effective instruments by using the gifts that he has given to us. It may be that God has given you or blessed you with the, with the, with the gift or with the acts of prayer. It may be that God has blessed you with the acts of giving or with the acts of teaching, serving or encouraging. Just like the young man had lost the accent, there are many ways that we can lose our accent. There are many ways that we can lose our cutting edge today. Axeheads don't work loose all at once. They work loose a little at a time. Anyone who has ever chopped wood knows that if you are paying attention, you can feel the axehead getting loose. And when that happens, you stop what you are doing and readjust the axehead. It's the same with us when we lose our cutting edge. It's seldom the result of one sin. It's much more the result of little compromises that loosen our integrity and faithfulness to God. As spiritual leaders and young people, when we neglect to study God's word and commune in prayer with him, we lose our cutting edge. As priests of the home, when we are constantly unkind, unchristian to people around us and in our family circle, we lose our cutting edge. As parents, when we are unable to train up our children in the ways of God, we lose our cutting edge. As husbands, when we treat our spouses with disrespect and there's no unity and love, we lose our cutting edge. As leaders of God's church, when we are unwilling to extend the hand of forgiveness to someone who may have hurt us, we lose our cutting edge. Many of the Lord's workmen today have lost the accent of power. They have lost the joy of salvation and have forfeited the abundant life offered only in Christ. The lost exit of the Spirit's unction has fallen into the waters of worldliness, into the ponds of indifference, into the swamps of sluggishness. They have ability, training, sincerity and earnestness, but they are chopping with the handle. They stand before a demonized world powerless and it must be said of them as it was said of the disciples before the demon possessed boy and they could not. This, friends, is the tragedy of the lost exits in the church today. And they could not, simply because we have lost something of value that now makes us ineffective. A story is told of a young lumberjack who went into a camp as a beginner. The first day he was excited and ready 
And even though he had never really cut wood uh, before, by the end of the day, he managed to cut or to fell 20 trees. And so when he got back into camp to sit around the campfire, he bragged about how well he had done on his very first day. Until one of the more experienced veteran lumberjacks put his, put his arm around him and said, 20 might be good, but experienced men here do 30 trees a day. Keep it up and in no time you will be right up there with us all. And so the next day, the young man, eager to impress, got up 15 minutes earlier, cut off 15 minutes from his lunch break, and he pounded and hammered and sawed away. But at the end of the second day, he had felled only 18 trees. And so he said, I will get up 30 minutes earlier tomorrow. I'll work my way through lunch. I'll get up 30 minutes. I'll work my way through lunch. But by the end of the third day, in spite of all his hard work, he had felled only 15 trees. By the end of the week, he was down to about 10 and 11 trees. And so swallowing his pride, he moped his way back into camp and he talked to the veteran lumberjack. He said, I don't understand. The harder I try, the more behind I fall. And so the veteran lumberjack said, do you know why you are so far behind? It's because you forgot to sharpen your axe. It's because you forgot to sharpen your axe. Sometimes we feel like we are swinging and swinging. And really, if truth be told, we are going or getting nowhere. And I can't help but wonder, friends, this morning, if God were to lean over right now and whisper something in our ears, would he ask, have you taken time to sharpen your axe? And this is true for, for every facet, for every area of our lives. It is true when it comes to our family life, our church life, our school life, our marriage life. We need to take time to sharpen our axe so that we become effective and useful. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, 10 says, If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen its edge, then one must exert more strength. However, the advantage of wisdom is that it brings success. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, 18, And do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that phrase, and be filled, is in the present continuous tense in the Greek. In other words, to stay filled, you have to be continually in contact with the Holy Spirit. A famous preacher once said, we have to be continually filled with the Spirit because we leak. And so picture a plastic cup that has a tiny hole at the bottom. You fill the cup and it starts to leak. But when you place the cup under a running tap, there is an overflow and the cup never runs dry. Likewise, when the Spirit stops flowing in our lives, we are prone to lose our temper. We are, pro we are prone to get angry over insignificant things. We are prone to break God's law. We are prone to become impatient and give in to the pride of life. Without the overflow of the Spirit's power and presence, we are then left to our own spiritual demise. How often have we found ourselves in this young man's position? The situation looked hopeless. We thought things were bad and perhaps getting worse. But I must tell you, friends, this morning that our extremities are but opportunities for our God to show his goodness, his grace, his love and his power. The question then is, once we lose our cutting edge, once we lose our access, how can we get it back? How can we retrieve it? Notice that the young man did three things. He said, um, and he cried out, I've lost it. So the first thing that we need to do is that we need to admit that we have lost our cutting edge. Secondly, we need to remember where it came from. The young man said, alas, it was borrowed. And lastly, the young man returned to where he lost it. We too need to return to where we lost our cutting edge. Verse 6 of Second Kings 6 says, And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he, kept, and he cut down a stick, and he cast it in, and the iron did swim. And notice Elisha was willing to assist the young student, and he just needed information. He needed to know where the axe head fell. Elisha did not scold the young man, but he asked him humbly to tell him what had happened. 
where did you fail the Lord and lose the conscious realization of his presence and power in your life? Was it perhaps when you stopped your private devotions? Was it when you stopped attending the house of God? Was it when you had a misunderstanding with someone? Or perhaps was it when you made an unholy alliance in your business partnership or in your marriage relationship? Was it when you committed that secret sin or entered into that dishonest transaction? Where did you lose your cutting edge? Was it when you allowed bitterness to seep into your life? Was it when you got angry with God because of what he allowed or did not allow to take place in your life? Where did it fall? Where did you lose your cutting edge? You see, friends, we will never recover our exit until we tell God just where we lost it. And so God wants us to confess. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. As soon as the young man cried out to Elisha, the prophet of God cut down a stick and threw it into the water. He threw it into the very place where the axe head was lost. And the Bible says, and the axe head swam to the surface. Now, can you imagine an axe head swimming? That's what the Bible says. In performing this miracle, the laws of gravity would be suspended. For we know from science class that iron does not float but sinks when placed in a body of water. Elisha performed the miracle by the use of a stick. Of course, needless to say that since they were chopping down trees, there would be branches and sticks and chips of wood scattered all over the ground. But notice that Elijah cut a new branch from a tree and threw it into the water. The book of Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Zechariah wrote in the sixth chapter that, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And just as Elisha cut it off to retrieve the exit, Jesus, friends, was cut off to save sinners. As Peter wrote, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. The word stick in the Hebrew can mean a sapling or even a tree. You see, what had seemed gone forever was now only within sight. It was within reach, all because a power greater than any human power was at work. When God wants to bring what we have lost within sight, he too uses the wood of a tree, wet not with water, but wet with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That piece of wood represented the cross of Christ. It shows us that there is no salvation, no miracle, uh, no divine intervention without Christ. It also foretold how Christ upon the wooden cross would rescue us from the depths of sin and restore us back into fellowship with God. That piece of wood in the water is also a reminder that we can do nothing without Jesus. When we place him first and foremost in our lives and invite him to intervene when there are hardships and trials and challenges, we can be assured that he will come to our rescue. There is a saying, what goes up must come down. But in the spiritual realm, it's just the opposite. What goes down must come up. And so when we think of death, we are reminded of the resurrection. When we think about the valleys of life, we are reminded about the mountain experience that we can have with God. God, friends, is in the business of lifting us up from the pitfalls of life. The axe was restored back to the original owner, just as we are restored back to God through the shed blood of the branch who is Jesus. The last thing the young man had to do was he had to pick up the axe head for himself. While the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is the provision for your recovery, you need to reach out and grab it and seize it by faith. You cannot be passive, but we are called upon to exercise our faith in the one who specializes in doing the impossible. This may be the end of the story as far as the biblical record is concerned. But we can be sure of what happened next. 
the young man firmly reattached the axe head to the handle and he went back to work, chopping down trees. He had recovered the cutting edge and was able to do what needed to be done. Once you and I have accepted responsibility and accountability for losing our spiritual edge and discovered where we lost it, and by faith, God wants us to pick up what we, are, what we have lost and to start working effectively once again. This means that we must take action. It means that if we have been neglecting God's word, we need to get back into, into the word of God. If we have been neglecting our prayer life, we need to get back into regular habits of prayer. If we have been neglecting our church attendance, we must renew our commitment to be in God's house whenever there is a worship service. If we have become complacent with not sharing Christ over the past year and putting the blame on COVID, we need to ask God to reignite our passion and desire for evangelism. Do you feel this morning that you have lost something in your life? Do you feel that something is missing? For many, if not all of us, we have lost our zeal, we have lost our commitment and spiritual power since being paralyzed by COVID-19 in 2020. Not being able to worship, not being able to fellowship with others resulted in us losing our connection with Christ and thus we've become discouraged, disheartened and distant from spiritual matters. Like the exit coming loose and plunging into the river, there are many areas of our lives that have gone to the bottom of the river. Our spirituality, our relationships, our financial situation, our health and our church life. And we feel as if these things are irretrievable. In a spiritual sense, yes, we may have lost our love for evangelism. We may have lost our desire to serve in God's church. We may have lost our meaning and purpose. In an emotional sense, we may have lost our love for our spouses, for our families, for our friends in Christ. In a physical sense, many of us have lost our jobs. We are unemployed. We may have lost our health. But the good news this morning is that God is willing to restore our lost accent. He is more than able, friends, to retrieve the irretrievable. He is more than willing to perform a miracle in both yours and my life. He is still making axe heads float and he can do it in our lives as well. We must believe that God can change any situation or dilemma that we find ourselves in. The book of Romans 4.21, the Apostle Paul reminds us when he says, And being fully persuaded that what he God had promised, he was also able to perform. That, friends, which we have lost can rise again. Isaiah 43.19 says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, so you do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. How committed are we? to experiencing God's presence and power in the church, in our life, in our families, in our communities. You see, our level of commitment will be revealed by what we are willing to do to see it become a reality. Remember the principles from the story. Admit that we lost it. Remember where it came from. Return to where we lost it. Rely on the branch, Jesus, to perform the impossible. And lastly, reach out and take it by faith so that we can be effective once again. An axe handle without the axe head is but a memory of what once was. Let God, friends, restore whatever you lost. It's time to reclaim our cutting edge. It's time to reclaim our iron axe head, whatever that may be for you, and get back to serving God and expanding his kingdom as we go for Christ. We cannot respond to the call to evangelize by saying, I will go, unless we have recovered our cutting edge, which is the spiritual power of the Holy Spirit. It was a bright Sunday morning in London, but Robert Robinson's mood was anything but sunny. All along the streets, there were people hurrying to church. But in the midst of the crowd, Robinson was a very lonely man. The sound of church bells reminded him of years gone by when his faith in God was strong and the church was an integral part of his life. 
It had been years since he had set foot in church, years of wandering disillusionment and gradual distraction from the God he once loved. And thus he became distant over time. As he walked along the street that morning, Robinson heard the clip-clop, clip-clop of a horse-drawn carriage approaching behind him. Turning, he lifted his hand to hail the driver. But then he saw that the carriage was occupied by a young woman dressed in fine robes going to church. He waved the driver to continue on, but the woman in the carriage ordered the carriage to be stopped. Sir, she said, I'd be happy to share this carriage with you. Are you going to church? Robinson was about to decline. He paused for a few seconds and then said, yes, I am going to church. He stepped into the carriage and he sat down beside the young woman. As the carriage rolled forward, Robert Robinson and the woman exchanged introductions. There was a flash of recognition in her eyes when he stated his name. That's an interesting coincidence, she said. Reaching into her purse, she withdrew a small book of inspirational verses, opened it to a ribbon bookmark and handed the book to him. I was just reading a verse by a poet named Robert Robinson. Could it be you? He took the book, nodding, saying, yes, I wrote these words years ago. Oh, how wonderful, she exclaimed. Imagine I'm sharing a carriage with the author of these very words. But Robinson barely heard her. He was absorbed in the words he was reading. They were words that would one day be set to music and become a great hymn of the faith, familiar to thousands of Christians around the world. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. His eyes slipped to the bottom of the page where he read, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Yes, my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. He could barely read the last few lines uh, through the tears that brimmed in his eyes. I wrote these words and I've lived these words. Prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. The woman suddenly understood and she said, you also wrote, Yes, my heart, O oh, take and seal it. You can offer your heart again to God, Mr. Robinson. It's not too late. And it wasn't too late for Robert Robinson. In that moment, he turned his heart back to God and walked with him for the rest of his life. Where are you this morning, friends, in your walk with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Like the hymn writer, have you found yourself drifting away from the Lord's arms of love, grace, and mercy as the fire that once burned with passion for Christ now grown coal? God's message for us this morning is that new beginnings are possible. God can retrieve the irretrievable. He can make our assets float. He can restore. He can redeem. He can recapture. He can recover that which we lost made possible only through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Shall we pray together? Gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for speaking and for revealing yourself through your word. I pray, dear God, that you may be with those among us who may have lost their accents uh, through neglect, through complacency and through compromise. I pray, dear God, that you will help us to retrieve the irretrievable. We pray, dear God, that you will help us to retrieve our lost accents. We pray that you may intervene in each of our lives, that you may step in and perform the impossible. Thank you for this wonderful story that reminds us that despite our hopeless situations in life, that there is hope as long as we place our trust, reliance and dependence upon you. And so I pray, Lord, that you will be with all those who are under my voice. May you attend to each need and may you just reassure us of your presence and power. I commit now ourselves into your hands, praying that, Lord, you will send your Holy Spirit to come, dear God, and to uh, empower us to live a faithful and a devoted Christian life is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.